This podcast is all about you. My guest today is Kieran Murphy. Kieran Murphy is a teacher from St. Patrick's Classical School, where I went to, and he was gracious enough to accept my invitation to come on. I actually never had Kieran as a teacher, but our paths crossed and we knew each other quite well in school, so it's a pleasure to have him on today. He contacted me in 2015 to make a video for St. Pat's Positive Mental Health Week and we've stayed in relative touch since then. So after catching up for a little bit, we had a proper conversation. So without further ado, here's Kieran Murphy. So, Kieran, this podcast is all about you. I'm delighted to have you on and I'll give a brief description of, of yourself and our relationship before, you know, as an intro. But I... Uh, Regardless of that, I'd like you to introduce yourself to me in your own words. Yeah, so uh, Kieran Murphy is my name and I am a secondary school teacher in uh, Navin. It's where I met you and probably a lot of people who are listening to this will know me from, from that as well. So I'm 33 years old, 34 next week. Oh. And uh, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. And um, yeah, I've been teaching St. Pat's in Navin for the last... Um, for the last probably 13 years now with a couple of years break in, in the middle so yeah yeah nice nice Danny and what led you on the path to become a teacher in the first place like, oh, why did you want to become a teacher kind of leaving secondary school and stuff yeah it's interesting because most people obviously say to you why do you want to be a PE teacher because a lot of people who like sport just think that they want to be a PE teacher but uh, the the main piece of advice that I always give to people who are who come to me and say, oh, you did PE, I'm interested in doing it, is if you want to be a PE teacher, primarily you actually, it's not that you like sport, it's actually that you like teaching. So if you decide, I really want to teach, I also like sport, then PE teaching is probably a good fit for you. And that, that was to me, that was the thing, because I, I like sport, but I also was very interested in, uh, in being a teacher and working with young people. And um, yeah, that was... That was what it was for me is I wanted to be a teacher but I also liked sport so being a PE teacher was a was a good fit for me. I don't really remember one particular moment where I decided I want to be a teacher. Just working when I was in, in a bit younger, working, coaching, uh, athletics um, and dealing with younger people and I always enjoyed it. I got a, a good buzz from it and it was just something that I was that I was interested in doing. So. Yeah, I then did the course and and was St. Pat's your first job? Uh, no, I worked in for one year in St. Mary's in Drada. Okay. Uh, so, which is good. I, was, I suppose I was quite lucky in that when I graduated, which was in 2006, there was just, a, there, there seemed to be a lot of jobs going. So maybe five or six years later, people were really struggling to get jobs. But I was lucky in that. Like I'm originally from Drada and I got my first job in Drada. Yeah. And then when, at the end of that year, uh, the person who I was taking over from was coming back from a career break themselves. Then I needed another job and actually was lucky enough I got uh, offered the job in St. Pat's. I had a couple of other offers to stay in Loud as well, but working in uh, in an all boys school at PE teaching and the name that St. Pat's has, it was kind of it was yeah. an exciting opportunity, one that I wanted to take up and yeah, I've been there ever since. So, and uh, I one one of the issues I had in Pats was that it was all boys and it seems like that was something that drew you to it from a teacher perspective. What what do you like about teaching in an all boys school? Uh, probably for me it's just I think boys are obviously for me a lot a little bit easier to relate to because obviously uh, I know what it's like when you're when you're growing up and you're that age as well and I just find boys are a little bit less less complicated Okay. Obviously, if people are listening to this. <laughs> uh, it's uh, yeah. It, it, I just think that boys are the good thing. I like about I think I like about teaching boys is you can have a blazing row with a with a lad, and you, you leave the room, and you'd be thinking, oh, really, he he's like I can't stand this lad, and you're thinking I never want to see this lad again. I hope I never have to teach him, and like two or three days later you can go back to having a great relationship with them. Okay. Whereas I've kind of found in my experience that girls, they just take a little bit longer to get over certain things like that. So okay. they can have an issue and it's maybe it's a slower burn yeah. and it doesn't come out and then it kind of festers. Yeah. And like a week or two weeks or even a month later, they might still have a grudge. Cause I did have experience like 
teaching girls in an all girls school and in a mixed school wow. when uh, when I was doing my teaching practice in college. Yeah. Um, and I just found that boys, it's just everything's a little bit more straightforward. Okay. When you're when you're teaching boys, and it's a little bit easier in in PE as well because obviously you've got just all boys are all. Uh, more at a similar level whereas it's a bit more difficult when you're trying to teach of course. P to a to mixed of course yeah mixed yeah I, I can only imagine and did you go to an all boys school yourself I did yeah I did uh, so again that's I suppose just where I'm more most comfortable because I went to St. Joseph's and Drogheda as well like, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. nice and obviously you, you liked it I did yeah yeah I've uh, have great memories from from the Joeys um, I suppose my big thing at the time was was athletics. I was really into athletics, cross country, and it had a really good name for cross country. And we had one particular uh, teacher who was in charge of the cross country, and uh, he was just like the 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 relationship that we had with him and with each other as a as a group, as a, like an athletics team, as a, as a cross country team, was uh, was really something I enjoyed. It's the thing that sticks out with me the most when I think back to my time in school. I don't remember like the classes as such or but I do remember the days out that we had and the successes that we had as part of the as part of the cross country team. So then so you reflect kinda of nicely on your time in school, you you enjoyed and this guy was presumably like a, a role model, an important character there, like Definitely, yeah, actually and then once I left and I became a teacher and I again I got involved in coaching some athletics in St. Mary's and um Mark was uh mark stevenson was the name he was very involved in north Leinster cross country athletics and organization and he kind of asked me uh to come on board and help out there was a position that uh in in north Leinster athletics which was treasure that he wanted someone to do and i was thinking look i'm just a straight out of college i don't want to be getting involved in anything next like that i just want to focus on this but i kind of got i got involved because i felt like i kind of owed him a little he'd okay. given me so much yeah. and given all of us so much and it was interesting then because for the next five or six years I worked with him as treasurer to it like and I got to know him then obviously on a different level than when I was in school yeah. as well like so I still had a very good relation I, like obviously even a stronger relationship with him then when I left uh, when I left school so. that's deadly I'm delighted you named him because I think so often there are people in our lives that oh there was this teacher I had in school and they meant a lot to me but you know Mark Stevenson yeah, 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 yeah. Things like if, he's, if he's listening <laughs> and then um, you mentioned that how when you left school and you worked alongside and you got to know him kind of from a, obviously from a different perspective and in your own life in your own career in your own person like do you see your, yourself as being the same inside of school or do you is it, do you have your teacher hat on when you're in school and then you you put it at the door when you get home or are you or are you able to be the same person like to like let's say an ex-student versus a student yeah um so you, you definitely are like i suppose not, not maybe more so in teaching but in any kind of work in in a lot of work you're kind of you have you as you said your work hat on and you're a different person work you're more professional or whatever yeah. i what in in my personal life i'm kind of i suppose i would think of myself kind of like a bit of a joker uh like yeah. messing around having the crack and kind of winding people up and like i'm i think i'm pretty easy going and I suppose I'm very different in uh, in school, particularly with the kind of with younger groups. Um, I'd say I'm fairly serious, fairly organised. Like they might look at me and thinking that I'm quite by the book. Okay. Um, and I, by doing that, I suppose it allows me then to kind of like ease up and loosen up as as they get a little bit older. So I definitely find that by the time lads have got the fifth year and sixth year, I think that I'm a lot more. Um, easy going with them and I kind of show them a little bit more of that side to myself like yeah. so the kind of jokey nature or whatever but definitely uh, definitely with the kind of first second and third years I kind of tried to stay away from that and yeah be a bit more kind of serious I suppose yeah and it just it springs to mind it would be important so that people don't kind of see uh, like a person but a very personal or very jokey or laid back attitude as something that could be taken advantage of yeah that's uh, that's the thing i suppose sometimes maybe that there's a risk that people think that but once they know that you are there's certain things that you're going to get done then as they get older they'll know that look there's a certain time to for this but there's also a time where you have to kind of 
be serious or whatever. Yeah. So and like we've we've had a, a bit of chatting since I left past like we were chatting this morning. Uh, it was good catch up. I can, I suppose, with the exception of that. I know you as one of the teachers that was in Pats mm. and that we, we knew each other somehow. When you look at uh, people in the school, even maybe even your colleagues or maybe even some people in your personal life and they think of, oh, that's, that's Kieran Murphy, he's a teacher in Pats. What doesn't that, what are the important aspects of who you are that that doesn't cover? Like when you, when you look at the first, I suppose more, most importantly, the first, second and third years and they, they see, fuck, uh, Kieran Murphy, he, you know, he's a good teacher, but, uh, you know, you, you don't get away with any shit with him, and you know he'll 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 catch out if you're acting the bollocks or something. Mm. Um, what don't they know about you that's like really important to who you are? Um, I don't know. Um, like I said, I suppose it's that kind of that easy going nature that I have in my kind of my own personal life, my private life. Um, maybe they don't they don't realize that yeah like we we chatted about it a little bit before like sometimes there's a risk that t uh, people see teachers as kind of people to be avoided or like kind of they don't want to like they don't think of them as as people outside of yeah just people who are there to teach them they live in the gym or they live in the classroom and they go to bed under the desk oh they're amazing <laughs> they see it like in the shopping center yeah. they're like oh my god there's mr murphy yeah. It's like uh, yeah, yeah. Don't die. it's like a celebrity or something. Yeah. Like you, I lived in that. I've lived in that for the last fifteen years. Yeah. I'm, going, I'm going to be in the shopping center. <laughs> so it's simple things like that. Um, like it's it's good that they know that you're a kind of person too, because I think in that case, they know that there's probably they, they they can say that look maybe he knows a little bit more about the situation I'm in. So kind of maybe if if someone's having a tough time, they think. Well, look, he's he's a person like anybody else. Maybe he has had a tough time, or maybe he's gone through, or he understands a little bit more, rather than seeing us as just teaching robots there to just give them the material, yeah. teaching the subject, but don't really understand what they're going through or what's going on with them, or don't kind of they like they maybe forget that we kind of actually do care a little bit about <laughs> what's going on with them, rather than, other than just this is what result you got in your test. Yeah, there you go. So and. Uh, that's clear to me uh, now on like reflecting on uh, who you are as a teacher and stuff like and you're telling me that you know you're the, you're the kind of no bullshit uh, not easy going teacher for first second third years but yet you led the you know the mental health week originally in 2014 2015 and now it's the well-being week and you're an important part of it as well what in what what may what inspired you to take part in that and to lead out on that because uh, obviously that's not the type of thing uh, a hard go and hard not you know fuck all the students teacher would do not to say that that's yeah, who you are right? yeah uh, like I suppose even though I, I like that's like that persona kind of said that like but I'm not immune to like having tough times myself like I, I've had issues in in the past with with my own mental well-being and um, I just I suppose I, remember, I actually I distinctly remember what uh where this came from so i was actually um i was having a bit of a tough time and i watched a documentary and it was uh the dona walsh documentary so i watched it and like i'm not someone who kind of gets too caught up or emotional watching something but it's just straight away i was like this is unbelievable this is so powerful it kind of just really resonated with me as like I said, someone who kind of was going through a tough time, but seeing someone else like Donald, who was obviously going through a much tougher time than I was, and yet still being able to be so positive and kind of, um, it was inspirational to me. Mm. So even though it was inspirational to me, I kind of just I looked and I said, this is something that I want to, I want other people to see. So I remember I had a fifth year health ed class at the time and I said, look, I'm going to show them this. So I didn't think anything more about it. I kind of showed them it. And about a week later, a group of them came up to me and they said, this is something that, um, this is something that we, like, we're not happy just to watch this. We want to do something. We want to organize a fundraiser. We want to do something. Mm -hmm. And off the back of that, um, I went to Colm and Colm was very supportive. And then there was a team, it was myself and, 
Nee Fallon and Mark Donnelly and the three of us just said, look, let's make this a bit of a thing. So, yeah. and it was what the, the best thing about it was that the, the students, even though like I was maybe one of the teachers who kind of brought the idea and kind of helped make a reality, the students really were the ones who were driving it. And they, um, they were like, right, we want to do a fundraiser. We want to set. So they, at the time there was the bands, the Donald Walsh Foundation, um, Live Life band. So they sold them in the school. That year was the probably the first what at the time it was Mental Health Week. Yeah. Even to this day, I think it was probably still for it to be for the first one. It was probably one of the biggest we ended up getting. Um, we had a, big, a lot of events on during the week, but it culminated in. Um, we had a big talk in the school, and we had uh, Brezzy, who uh, at the time was obviously quite vocal in his own struggles, and we had Tommy Tiernan, who was the next student of the school. Yeah. And then as well, we had uh, Donald Walsh's mother. Yeah. So we invited them in, they spoke to the whole school, and it was just, it was so successful. And then since that, it's become a staple part of the of the, of the year in St. Pat's now, every year. And we've changed now to Wellbeing Week, given yeah. the that's like really, really important and really central to schools at the minute Yeah, is this idea of well-being. Yeah. It's uh, like they're really trying to embed it in every single aspect of the school. So yeah. well-being week now and it's, yeah. At, at, th at times I can be pedantic and I'm always talking about emotional well-being over mental health and you know, because mental health kind of seems clinical and mm. uh, it's, it's hard. I know it's, it's a, some people will describe somebody who's emotionally unwell, like let's say, are experiencing a really tough time in lives they could be you know in in a very bad state of depression and they'll, they'll say something like, or oh, they have the mental health and you're like what whereas i think well-being emotional well-being is kind of more inclusive anyway that's that's an aside yeah no it brings a certain positivity to it doesn't it because yeah. you don't you don't have to have had hard times yeah to to be talking about well-being so you talk about mental health it's something like i said what's wrong with you yeah so to me i like i remember the first time I ever had an issue with it. Like, so growing, growing up, I had a very, very, like, good childhood. I, like, no issues at all. Very, very happy. Uh, I don't remember a single thing along the line where I kind of wasn't just this positive person. And then I remember something happened, and I don't even remember what it was, but it just got me into a way of thinking. And it was so foreign to me. And then all of a sudden I was going, I remember I was looking up, like, Googling, do I have depression? Uh, yeah. And you're kind of looking at it and you're going, this is this is a very strange feeling. But again, it's like that. It's like, well, now I have a mental health issue. Yeah, yeah. So then we flip around and we say, well, no, like let's just make these kids in school very aware from day one about their well-being. They don't have to have had an issue in the past yeah. for them to know that being well is something that they want. So yeah. well-being then becomes obviously a huge thing compared to Oh, a mental health issue, yeah. or as you said, oh, he's got the mental health. Yeah, know? and it's funny. Uh, you said you, you so, something happened along the line, and you can't really put your finger on what it was. Like uh, sometimes the way people talk about it, it's, it's as if you know they got they got cut by a, a rusty bit of metal, metal, and oh shit, oh I got the depression now. Yeah, you know it's as if something you catch off something, or yeah. you, you know there doesn't need to be a, a massive event in your life. And we actually we had mentioned this before we started recording that uh, you know when you're reflecting your life there's nothing really big that stands out you know in your life as you know particularly traumatic or particularly you know unbelievable or whatever no. but yeah you know you can still go through think, thinking like oh fuck am i depressed you know and searching that and be like fuck me this is weird mm. um and maybe maybe you can relate to this uh from the from that time I was speaking last night to my mother about, uh, you know, how when we're suffering, when we have a bad mindset, at least I felt very peculiar. I was like, mm. what the fuck is wrong with me? Mm. I can, the way I'd react to things, I'd be like, Jesus Christ, I am I feel like I'm reacting in a way that nobody would ever react because it's so fucking crazy or stupid or saddening or painful. And it's only over time that I realise, oh, this is, this is kind of normal. Mm. There's nothing really that special about me suffering. And it kind of made me feel less, less like a freak, yeah. less like somebody who had a broken brain and more like somebody who has shared experiences with other people, do you know? Yeah, like I suppose, again, I, I don't know, like I think maybe if I kind of look back and I kind of I suppose maybe 
around about 10 years ago was the first time I kind of maybe was feeling any issues around it. And I don't know if it's, it's because of that or if it's actually a physical thing that has happened. But obviously since that, this whole uh, uh, area of mental health has become just so much more open. And I think, um, yeah, like go back to that time 10 years ago, you, there was a kind of a, a mindset maybe of, of what's wrong with me. I'm, mm. I'm abnormal, I'm a freak for thinking like this. Whereas now it's so well advertised yeah. about how many people do have issues with anxiety or mental health issues. You kind of, you do feel a little bit normal. And as you said, it's like, yeah, maybe I'm not that special. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not that special that this, I'm the only person that's having, why am I, why am I feeling like this? What's wrong with me? Yeah. Whereas people now, I suppose, have a realization that, look, this is something that a hell of a lot of people have to deal with in their lives. I think, I think possibly the most painful aspect of what I'm suffering is the kind of, that feeling of loneliness. Mm. You know, I, I am alone in this suffering. This is something that I am experiencing. And it's only when I get maybe moments of more clarity, I'm like, oh, no, wait a minute. This is stuff that loads of people experience all the mm. time. Now, I'm at this moment, I'm not in a position where maybe I'm in contact with these people, but I'm not alone in my suffering, you know? Mm. So I think, I think that can be helpful. And, and I hope, and I know initiatives like what you spearheaded uh, to, with the Mental Health Week in 2014, will help students and younger people realise that right when when they do hit that moment that kind of fork and rover like jeez I'm not feeling good oh well fuck we talked about this in Wellbeing Week uh, Mr Murphy showed me that that Donald Walsh documentary in, in Health Dead like no this is this is actually a normal kind of thing to go through yeah know? like and I suppose it's it's so what what was a massive help to me and again when I was in school there was I don't remember, I don't want to say that there was no education around depression or, but I don't remember it. Now it could be because I didn't, I didn't understand how this was a thing. I, I, I didn't understand how people could be depressed. I was like, yeah, people can have a bad day, but like, how do you have bad day after bad day after bad day? How do you get to that stage? I, I just didn't understand it. Mm. So maybe because I didn't understand it, I wasn't really listening out for it. But I suppose what I'm trying to do now is, and, and not just me, what the system, what the education system, I suppose, is trying to do is making well-being a more central focus so that boys in particular are able to actually talk about it. Yeah. So they, you give them the language and you give them the the ability to kind of to talk about it the way they're feeling yeah. and normalize it and say, All right, you don't have to, you don't have to be feeling bad to talk about what the way you're feeling. You can just understand how you're feeling and how to deal with it. So next year in, uh, in St. Pat's, there's going to be um, 10 minutes every day tutor time. So you're going to meet your tutor for 10 minutes every day. And we're trying to develop a program where that's not just, okay, show me your journal. How many notes do you have? Your own attention. <laughs> it's like, all right, so the talks about it at the minute is, right, every Monday with your tutor, you're going to do like a, some sort of body scan. So you're kind of going to just talk through how are you feeling? What are you thinking? We're going to get lads to write reflections on, on how their week went. And it's just all this, this process of getting them to kind of just be, to normalize talking about their feelings, yeah. analyzing how they're feeling themselves, just trying to get them in touch with that side yeah. a little bit more. And yeah, like we're not special in, in, in St. Pat's like there, this is happening all over the country. So look, I think, I think things are definitely in a positive place yeah. overall yeah. In, in schools from that point of view and, and preparing students for inevitable, like 920 lads, some of them are going to have tough times ahead. Yeah. And it might be tough times in terms of they might have to deal with something that actually happens, like maybe a loss or um, something happens in their, in, their, in their work life or they lose their job. That's obviously a tough time or it might just be something like I had where there was no particular yeah. event yeah. which brought this on. It was just a way or a kind of just a cycle that I got myself into. For me, it was kind of like, um, it was just a, a negative mindset that yeah. I got myself in. I didn't really, I wasn't, a, I, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of where it came from. Yeah. Right? It kind of just, it wasn't something I was used to dealing. So whether it's a, an outside event or a trauma or whether it's something that 
you kind of you, you can't even explain yeah given lads tools that they can kind of deal with that a little bit better like that's something i think that's i think it has to be positive yeah and no uh I'm generally speaking not a fan of the clinical perspective, but I think it might be helpful for yourself and maybe for whoever's listening. When it comes to things like bereavement, mm. a doctor will never, a doctor should never mm. diagnose somebody as depressed mm. if they're fucking family, if a family member died, if a friend died, mm. if, a, if a pet died, you know, that's grief. And grief is, again, is really fucking normal. The, the, bereaving processes that people go through are incredibly painful but it's not again it's, there's not an issue with you there it's just it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult time and there are ways there are more and less effective ways to progress through it usually speaking things like depression are only diagnosed when there hasn't been something in a person's life that you can pinpoint so if you, I, I suppose what I'd say is if you or anybody else is feeling really bad don't get bogged down and looking for the thing yeah. that you know will justify your ill feeling. You're like, no, it's, it's I don't I don't need to have my fa- I don't need to have someone in my family die. I did I don't need to have you know uh, lost my job. I don't need to have fucking been in a bad car crash for me to feel this bad. Yeah. I'm allowed to feel this bad and kind of work work from that point as opposed to flagellating yourself because I think you can make you can almost make the experience more painful by searching and not finding and then you judge yourself mm. you know it's yeah and no, I suppose labeling like you don't want to just label it like that so I, yeah. I agree yeah yeah, yeah um, you mentioned that you you enjoyed school yeah and would you I suppose with that in mind was there anything you would have done differently or would like when you reflect back if you could go back in time and say oh young Kieran this is the advice I would give you now for the next five years. Would it, would it be anything you'd say to your 12 or 13 year old self? Um, I don't know. Um, like I said, I had, I had a great time in school, so I wouldn't want to go back and, and, and change much about it. Um, I suppose I can maybe look at it now and, and think, so in my experience of working with, uh, with students now, one thing that I think maybe is lacking in, 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 in a lot of young lads now is resilience mm. so i would say and, and and maybe for me as well like because nothing nothing happened there was nothing i had to kind of be resilient against yeah. kind of I, I suppose i might prepare myself for the fact that life wasn't going to be a garden of roses forever and ever and ever yeah. and i kind of find that now with, with, with teaching young lads i think we were kind of talking about before we started recording but young people now I find are so different from when they were like 10 years ago yeah. and there's a culture of like the, the best way I can describe it so we occasionally uh, organise trips away so maybe you go away to a soccer match or whatever and 10 years ago you brought a lad away and it was the best thing ever like yeah. you brought them away you went to see a football match you went bowling in the evening time there was an activity there wasn't much yeah. but best crack ever yeah, yeah. The lads are so appreciative whatever now like if you were to do that now there's almost like, well, what are we doing for the next two hours? Oh, we're we just having a bit of free time. No, no, no. Like, entertain me. Like, yeah, <laughs> we're going on this trip. Uh, or like you go into a into that same arcade that you were 10 years ago and just bowling on those machines. Not that. This is a shit arcade. Like, yeah. lads have a certain entitlement. Mm-hmm. I think, like, parents are, like, they, all that they want to do is they want to give their son or their daughter the best. Mm-hmm. But they, they, sometimes they kind of, the kid just gets so used to having the best all the time and then they just like I said they've they've no resilience like something happens and everything's gone their way and then all of a sudden they they can't deal with it something small might happen and it affects them a lot more than it should be so yeah I kind of that's something that I'm hoping to maybe like work into the well-being program for next year is building resilience building resilience because it's important like we said things are going to happen and you you are going to have to be able to kind of take them on the chin and and deal with them yeah and and not let them derail you like yeah. you know, or not like definitely you have to be able to kind of deal with them to the best of your own abilities yeah. so to me i would kind of just say to myself look that's the only advice i give myself like don't change anything but just be prepared yeah that it's not always going to be like this and then yeah. a certain amount of it so like enjoy it while you can i often like reflect now and i kind of think maybe particularly in my kind of like 
my college years or whatever like I really wish I could go back and like they are they are so enjoyable like you meet some great people uh, I was living in Limerick so living away from home and I kind of I almost feel like I didn't make the most of it okay. I kind of wish I could go back and kind of say look this is you're carefree you're young like enjoy it while you can yeah and yeah. so that's probably another piece of advice I'd give myself yeah it's like a nostalgia as well well it's funny I think um when you're talking about maybe the low levels or or maybe even lower levels of resilience in younger people today I think w what's sprung to my mind is that the quality the quality of life and the quality of distractions have become so much better over the last 10 years you know um not to fucking be uh, going on about what's kind of already been talked about in the media and stuff like oh you know there's so much smartphones there's so many apps people are spending too much time on their screens or too much time on their screens you're online too much all that kind of stuff but i did i didn't have that high quality of distraction you didn't have it like these things are kind of grabbing so that when you are in those kind of quieter moments where I, when i would have you know decided to do something mad with the lads or fucking act the maggot or uh, have the crack you know by just having a chat in, in the bedroom we were staying in or in the hotel we were staying in you know the equivalent now is like they're looking for something to really distract themselves like I think distraction is possibly one of the biggest sources of suffering now because when when we ha if people are actually experiencing some emotional difficulty well then you know Facebook doesn't cut snatch at us and cut and it might even be perpetuating the pain do you know what i mean so yeah i it's, it's hard it's hard to know what the best way to build that resilience is but uh immediately what comes to mind is what you're what you're doing in the school is practicing expressing yourself mm. and the more you express the more you practice expressing yourself be it through journaling be it through like a what you describe like a body scan or, or talking to your tutor the more effective you will become with expressing yourself because there are more or less effective ways of expressing yourself you know one way of expressing myself is to fucking fuck all my toys out of a pram and start banging my head against the wall and screaming and not letting anybody speak to me that's a way of expressing yourself now there are more effective ways to give the same message so like i'm feeling fucking angry i'm mm. feeling very anxious mm. you know so and you'll only get that with practice and it was uh, until there's maybe a few years of systems like the one that you, Pat is employing in other schools yeah. are playing. Yeah, yeah it'll, it'll, it'll take it'll take it'll take a while for that to kind of feed through. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. yeah, and like it's not it's not it's not silver bullet. No, it's not going to cure everything, mm. but it's definitely going to help people yeah. be able to be more expressive and like as you said, kind of make the decision that well I could flip that table over yeah. or I could actually say you know what I'm really annoyed yeah. and just be a little bit more give the kids language that they can actually express yeah. the way they're feeling yeah and I think the funny thing is the, the first or second or third or fourth time the table will always be flipped over but there, the more kind of intervention stuff you do like where you give kind of kids tools and stuff and uh, maybe provide them with emotional lessons where they can go alright you know this isn't an effective strategy for me feeling better or feeling less stressed or bored or whatever it might be and even with that in mind so you go back and say uh you know be ready for a fucking shit hitting the fan at, at some stage and you know enjoy enjoy your college years a bit much or a bit, a bit more i should say oh, a bit much <laughs> and uh with that in mind what do any emotional lessons or, or kind of tools spring to mind in your daily life now is are there are there when you're faced with adversity like do you have resilience tools like what sort of resilience do you have now that let's say you may have lacked 10 years ago or what sort of resilience do you have now that you'd like to impart onto a, a 10 a 10 year old or a 15 year old or a 25 year old or a fucking 30 year old like it's, it's yeah it's a difficult question to answer because i, I really like i my own belief is that what works for one person um, isn't necessarily going to work for everybody and everyone has to find their own individual way of dealing with things that they have so I'm kind of cautious about kind of saying well like I can certainly say this is what worked for me but there might be people out there listening who are kind of going through a tough time and they might be thinking well that's easy for you to say yeah but, so like for me definitely what helps me when I am having tough times and I still have them like 
I think maybe one thing is when I when I went the first time where I was going through a, a, a spell of depression was that I kind of w- once I started to feel a little bit better I kind of thought to myself geez that's great I'm kind of 25 or 26 now and I've got my period of depression out of the way so the rest of my life is yeah. head sailing you know yeah. and then when all of a sudden it started to kind of affect me again I was like no no no, no I've already I've already had this like yeah. so like on and off like since that I've had times where I kind of I find found things a little bit more difficult and things that help me so I suppose I'm I think I'm quite lucky in that I never had a problem expressing my feelings so like if I went to a counsellor and it wasn't kind of going in there and they didn't have to like pry it out of me I was singing like a bird I was going in there and I was yeah. like saying exactly what I was feeling I didn't have a filter and like people maybe who are listening to this who know me like the might like I, I've never been really open about this before with anybody like certain people who are close to me will know that I've had issues with depression but I, I haven't really been open about it in the past so they might be surprised because I think I kind of hide it quite well a lot of times and um, but when I went into a counseling session I was like yep yeah, this is what I'm feeling and kind of I was able to get off my chest so definitely for me it was helpful and it is a bit cliche but it was helpful that I was able to talk about it yeah um, and that there was people I could talk about it too so yeah. in this case it was maybe a person a, a, a counsellor but there was also people in my in my life um, who I was able to talk about it with as well but yeah it was good that I didn't just I wasn't talking to them the whole time I was also able to talk to professionals as yeah. well like so definitely definitely so I suppose you had that inherent strategy to be able to express yourself but if someone wasn't able to that's the first thing to address you know uh, right how, how am I going to express myself okay maybe I'll fucking talk to you know my the, the closest person in my family first or maybe I'm going to talk to a complete or a stranger who's going to be totally inconsequential to yeah. what, what I want to hear so yeah. like that's I think that's a good that's a really good starting point for yeah. people like if you're if you're if you're ready if you're ready and able to share with people great that's what you need to do if you're not okay how do we get to that point but there is so much support out there as well like so like you might want to talk to someone you trust maybe it's a person that um uh that you know personally maybe someone that's in your personal life we talked about how in the school our kind of focus this year was on trying to make sure that every kid had one good adult in the school that they could talk to it was a younger person is there a teacher or somebody in the school that they feel that they can talk to Maybe it's not someone that you feel you can talk to. Maybe it's a it's it's a helpline that you ring because you think, well, at least they don't know me. So you're talking to somebody they don't know you. So there's no there's no repercussions there. There's no fallback on you. They don't know who you are. Yeah. That can be helpful. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's journaling, like you said. I'm not very good at that sort of thing. I like I. Sometimes you kind of you don't have to practice what you preach. So yeah. I like we'll talk about next year. We'll talk about. This idea of getting the kids to write down the way they're feeling, I'll never do that. Yeah. I, I don't do it. It just yeah. it's not something that I yeah. that I've ever found helpful. Yeah, it was something that I tried. Um, it was a strategy that I tried. Yeah, I gave it a go for maybe a desperation. I was like, yeah. I'll do anything to help myself yeah. feel better. Yeah, but I quickly stopped. Yeah, it just wasn't didn't work for me. So, but it might like you don't have to to verbalize it. Yeah, as long as you're getting it out of you. If you're getting yeah. down on paper, that can be helpful. Yeah. And I think there are, there are universal rules which are, I think, possibly applicable to everybody. Again, back to the idea of what I've talked before with the universal human condition. So it's key that everybody express themselves. Now, the way an, an individual might express themselves will differ from one person to the other. Mm-hmm. You know, so for you, journaling, fuck that. It's no. not for you. Not really. uh, but, you know, I know there is, I know people in my life who journal all the time and if they stop journaling their fucking their life gets more difficult and they're yeah. like shit I haven't mm. been journaling mm. you know so although you you share your you verbalise your experiences you know with somebody mm. be it a family member or maybe a counsellor you know another person might do something totally different but yet kind of doing the same thing it's expressing yourself it's communicating do you know yeah. what I mean and like uh, and as well and also maybe it's like somebody who's kind of into music and yeah. they're like writing a song or if it's like someone who's into poetry not yeah. that there's not that many around but for yeah. some people it's helpful but yeah. again as you said it's just getting out of you because yeah. a lot of times you talked about that inner kind of inner monologue yeah. before 
and you kind of feel like you're the only person who has this and everyone has it yeah, yeah. but um, like yeah it can be helpful to actually get that out of you by writing or by yeah. talking yeah and um, for me it was kind of for me it was very helpful because I always felt so if I, I could be working or I could be having a conversation with you or I could be having a conversation with somebody and I wouldn't actually be thinking about like I, we could be talking about the football match that was on last night yeah. and I'll be talking about it yeah but I'd be given that 10% of my concentration and yeah. 90% of my head is kind of thinking about I really don't feel like this I just don't feel well like kind of t- thinking about my own issues yeah um, and for, for me the reason why counselling was so good was because it matched up I, I wasn't trying to think about something else yeah I was actually just thinking about something and saying it yeah whereas like in school I would be kind of like teaching yeah but I'd be kind of still thinking about my own issues in my head yeah so it's the only time where actually and even like at the, even though I didn't stick with it the journal at least you're kind of writing down it's it, everything's marrying up yeah you're thinking about what you're actually your current activity yeah so that to me was was why it was so helpful as well that's a that's an interesting thing and it, it it's somewhat i didn't feel like i was fake like, yeah I, like and it was frustrating because like i was talking to you about and, and like I, I wanted to talk to you about football and i yeah. wanted to be fully invested in that conversation but i wasn't in in that moment you didn't have the capacity you know you couldn't bring your attention on that thing because you were emotionally not at the best place you could be like you know and i think some people if not most people actually don't know what the best way is to express themselves for them you know so it takes trying the journal it takes fucking reading the poetry and like you said you know not there's probably not that many people out there that you know do the poetry thing but that's because it's just not out there like it's you never know like it could work for 50 percent of people but only 5% of people try it and it works for them and they do it. Mm. But yet there's so many people who haven't explored these different avenues of expressing themselves. Mm. Do you know? Um, so it's worth, I think it's definitely worth sampling and trying. But there's mm. so many different ways that we can help our own minds and help our own quality of life. And sometimes some of them won't work, but some of them fucking will. Mm. And it's important to discover those things. Uh, and one a practice I've done, which I find very helpful, has been, let's say, in a, in a moment of clarity, in a moment of general uh, well-being, I'd be like, right, what are the things that make me feel good and I'm feeling shite? Well, fucking one, love me music, listen to me music. Two, I love exercise and so going for a run or uh, dipping in like cold water or something. Uh, three, fucking uh, talk, like calling up one of the lads and talking shite about whatever we've been up to for the last couple of weeks, you know, as a catch-up. Like, and, you know, I... I have this list of strategies that I can basically refer to and be like, right, there's all these things I can do to make myself feel less fucking shit. Yeah. Let's fucking, let's go through the list and go, right, I'll try this. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to have motivation to do that, but yeah. I think it's good to know, at least in some moments, yes, I can feel better, have that yeah. capacity. I don't have it right now, yeah. but I do have that ability at some stage. Yeah. You know? um, I suppose, as well, another thing we were just talking about, like the, the strategies that are helpful, I suppose, as well as for me, so the, the two things I find most helpful are, are the fact that I am able to talk about it as well. Yeah. Um, and I suppose now it's a um, combination of maybe number one, just knowing that I kind of like eventually you do, you do kind of snap out of it, like, or not, not snap out of it, but it does kind of turn around a little bit. Um, so, like, like I keep referring back to like the and in my initial experiences with it, and I just kind of felt I wasn't I didn't understand how I was ever going to get it. This became like a cycle and a way of thinking that I got myself into, and I genuinely like I genuinely didn't understand how it was ever going to be any different. I was like, well, if I'm thinking a little bit about this now, like I know I'm going to be thinking about it tomorrow, which means I'm going to be thinking about it the next day and the next day, and it was a cycle that I genuinely didn't didn't ever see how it could like get better for me but it did yeah it did but then like i said i was like hey that's great that's my that's my little spell done but then it came back and i had more issues with it but and each time it's it's come back since i kind of at least i've always had the knowledge that that like look it does eventually get better and it's hard to pinpoint when it does because the way i explained it to somebody recently was 
I distinctly remember when I was trying to learn how to swim. So, a quick side note, I'll give you a funny story uh, about when I started my PE teaching. So what we had to do at the time to Limerick, when you were in Limerick, was you had to do what was called a movement ability test. So you get your points to get to being, uh, to being to, to get into the course, but you had to show that you had the physical capabilities to be able to, to do the physical aspects of the course. So it was very, very straightforward. You had to like throw a ball against the wall and catch it. Like, and it wasn't being scored right, and it wasn't as if you had to throw it against 10 times, and if you yeah. caught it eight times or less, or if you yeah. caught it, if you dropped it two times or more, that was it, you're right. Yeah. Very, very easy, like, just yeah. to see that you were able to move, yeah. and you weren't... General just, mobility. Yeah, you, yeah. You, that was it. But one of the aspects was swimming. Yeah. So, um, I, I couldn't swim. I learned how to swim when I was a child, but I had never swam between the ages of like eight and 18 when I was yeah. going to college. So I couldn't swim. So I said, like, right, okay, I, I have to be able to swim 25 meters. Okay. So the week before this movement ability test, I went and I went to the local pool and it was a shallow pool. So I jumped in, uh, it was 25 meters long. So I said, right, if I can get from here to here, I'll be able to do the test. I know I'm gonna have to get better, but I am going to be able to do it anyway. So I got in and I pushed myself off the wall and I, splashed and splashed around whatever like and it wasn't very graceful but I got my 25 meters so yeah I said right I'll, I'll, yeah. I have enough that I can do that bit anyway yeah so down we went to Limerick today the movement ability test and did all the other parts so that right the last part is the swimming so get your uh, swim togs on and everyone was lined up grabbed so they're like right, who's gonna start and one of the lads was like yeah I'm gonna start ran and jumped in and the key difference here was the fact that this was an Olympic swimming pool so it was 50 metres which is grand because you only had to swim 25 okay. but you were starting in the deep end okay so um, so he just went in dove in and swam down to the end and jumped out and he was like yeah great off you go tick 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 so eventually all the lads from the rest of down the line are jumping in and doing their bit and I'm like oh, oh no this is in the deep end I'm not ready, <laughs> not ready for this and um, it gets down to the stage where all the lads have gone and it's just all the girls and they're looking at me kind of going well, well clearly all the rest of the yeah, lads have gone yeah, yeah. so now this was back 10 years ago now where <laughs> it wasn't quite as like uh, the way it is now with like women and equality and everything it's great between the yeah they, they were just they were, she, the women were just going well look you're, you're the lad the rest of the lads yeah, have gone yeah, yeah. I was like fucking that's now or never yeah you're a big audience so I was like fuck it so I jumped in so the problem was my feet never touched the bottom so I jumped in and my feet never touched the bottom. And panic stations. I was like, oh, panic. Oh, my God, I'm drowning. The, the, the instructor who was doing the test had to put in the brown stick. Yeah. So if you remember from when you were learning at school and you were a kid, uh, learning at school when you were a kid, there's the brown stick that if you get into trouble, you choke in. So you grab the brown stick and I kind of reef myself onto the side, like spluttering water out of my lungs. And I, oh, <laughs> I was like, I can't swim. So... It's pretty embarrassing. Um, so anyway, uh, all the rest of the girls then went and they did their swimming. So I, I had to wake back and she was like, okay. And I was like, yeah, look, I can't swim. Like, I'll try very hard. Yeah. She goes, you, you don't have to swim. You just have to show that you've no fear of water. And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure I've already done that anyway. But she's like, right, come up with me to the shallow end. Oh. So I had to go to the shallow end, hold on to the to the side and just start like dipping my face into the water. Yeah. It's like, yeah. just to show that I had no yeah. fear of water. And as I was doing this, all the people were kind of walking by me, all of my future classmates were walking yeah. by me, just looking going, oh my God, it was so, at the beginning of the first so year. embarrassing. And then I went in anyway, and I, I was fully sure that I was not going to get in anyway, but I did. And the first day I went into college, they were looking at me and they were going, who the fuck did you get in here? Yeah. <laughs> Literally, you cannot fail. If you pass this test, you yeah. cannot fail this test. Yeah, yeah. But the, the reason I tell that story is because so I, I couldn't swim and I had to learn how to swim for the course and about halfway through I remember thinking I'm never going to be able to learn how to swim. I'm never going to be able to. And I don't know when the point was where I stopped not being able to swim and I started being able to swim. Okay. But I can swim now. Okay. And I remember when I was learning to drive I was just like I had a really hard time with it. I was like I'm never going to be able to learn. I'm never going to be able to, to drive. And all of a sudden I don't know when it was, but I think back and now and I go, well, 
I can drive now. Yeah. And I kind of apply that same thing to kind of my own mental well-being. I don't know when that moment was yeah. where I stopped not feeling well and I started feeling well. Yeah. But it happened. Yeah. So you, I can't pinpoint exactly when it was, but yeah. over time, you look back and you go, well, I'm feeling well now. And I, get, I, I, know, and I don't know when it was, but it just happens. Yeah. And each time I've had an issue, it's helpful for me to know that, look, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I, I, don't, I don't have the magic solution. I don't know what I'm going to do. But eventually, one of the days I'll wake up and I'll be feeling a little bit more like myself. Yeah. And that to me is helpful. And for me, it's worked in, in terms of each time I've had an issue, the, the time from when it, it, I kind of feel like I'm starting to feel a little bit that I'm not happy with my own state of mind to when I actually feel like, you know, I'm a little bit back to yeah. myself now. Yeah. The time is kind of getting shorter. Yeah. So I don't know what it is that I'm doing. Interesting. But yeah. the acceptance of knowing that eventually something will yeah. change, something, and I will get better, it just seems to have helped me to deal with it. That's, yeah. That's so, cool. sorry, lo long story short, no, you, you'll, no, you'll, you'll have to edit that one down. No, I'm going to be honest, though. Uh, no, that's, that's really interesting. And it, it enforces the whole idea of the temporal nat nature of suffering it's not going to last forever no. now i i wouldn't like that anecdote to demotivate people from trying to do to do something to make themselves feel better but it does it really reflects quite well i think on the virtue of patience it's just to say that there's no one thing that you're going to do yeah it might be a combination of things yeah. and like you said i wouldn't put people off so trying the things that like you said like, i've got these strategies that yeah. i know that when i'm feeling well i enjoy to do yeah. so but it just there might not be a case of okay one thing and then you're better it might yeah. like you you might not know why or yeah. when it, exactly excuse me it happens yeah but it it does eventually yeah i think if you, if you foster that philosophy it kind of it allows you to feel a bit shite now like that's all right to feel shite now mm. and because you're you're like because this isn't going to be forever and you have by the sound of things now if you encounter difficulty you have uh, you have patience to be like right i'm feeling shy now but i know in the past that i felt shy for a while mm. and that i at some kind of point there was some turn i never noticed it but i started feeling better and there i was and it's you still know? incredibly difficult don't get me wrong like if someone's listening to this and they're saying that's great for you now because obviously yeah. it sounds like you're in a better place than i am but it's horrible like when you, when you do have that like that initial kind of like i said i characterize it as an initial period of time where you're starting to feel like okay now i'm going through a time where i'm not very very happy in my own state of mind it's horrible yeah like i don't want i don't mean to cheapen it and say like oh like it gets better so yeah be grand yeah like yeah, it's horrible yeah. it's horrible and yeah. you know it like and anyone who's had issues will will, will know it as well and it's horrible to be in that situation but yeah, that, that's just my personal experience. And you, you alluded to it. I actually, I hadn't realised mm. that you had gone through some counselling and you had got seeked it out. Mm. So obviously, when you were feeling shite, you employed some kind of intervention strategies. Were there any other intervention strategies you had? Or could you, would you be able to talk about it or tell, talk about the helpful aspects of the counselling you you went to i know you mentioned kind of the the marrying of your cognitive energy being how you express yourself i think that's fucking daily yeah that was, that that was for me the most helpful part as i said it was um it was a case of uh yeah what i i was thinking about what i was talking about so yes that's it was i didn't feel a conflict with myself because i was kind of talking about what i was thinking so um, so yeah, counselling and I had like different forms of it. Um, okay. And you know, I, I, I can't... Was there a more effective form of counselling? Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. No, yeah, uh, well, no, like, so I had um, CBT counselling, which is cognitive and behavioural therapy. Um, and I had other times I had counselling, which was more kind of just, just um, like emotional counselling. So there wasn't any particular strategies that people employed. But... Um, no, I can't, like, at, at the minute now, I can't really think of one that was more helpful than okay. others. Um, it was just nice to kind of, to, to, like I said, to talk about it and kind of get certain things yeah. off your chest and maybe kind of feel like you are making progress. And I don't think I ever left 
a counseling session feeling worse that when, when I went into it. I always okay. had even maybe just a slight kind of period of relief or maybe a kind of like a like a hopefulness or something. I just remember kind of sometimes leaving the counseling session, you're just kind of going, all right, things are starting to, I kind of felt like things were starting to get a little better. So even if it was just temporary or whatever, so. Yeah, mm. that's interesting thing to do. It reminds you of how people talk about exercise sometimes as well. You know, yeah. I'd always feel better after exercise. Yeah, and look, obviously I'm a PE teacher as well. Like, and that was, I suppose another thing that I, th I think for me was very, very helpful is I never let it stop me from doing things. Okay. So like, like I, I've never taken, even though I've had periods where I've, I've been finding it very, very difficult, I've never taken a period of time off work. Okay. Uh, I never stopped playing football or rugby. Yeah. Which were two sports that I was involved in. Um, so I kind of never felt that it was something that was stopping me from doing those things. Um, and because it, it, once you kind of lose that momentum, like once you start to see maybe a little bit of progress with it, it's very, very easy to build on that momentum. Yeah. It's when you kind of stop completely yeah it can be very very difficult to kind of keep going to get going again so for me one of the things that was definitely helpful the exercise obviously is, is very good because you kind of do feel better after it. yeah um, and just to me as well that was a, it was a social thing so i was i was I, I was looking forward to i got in amongst like a group of friends that group of lads that i was like uh that i enjoyed being in their company and like talking about earlier on like, my personality like having the crack and kind of maybe slagging people off and that kind of that atmosphere was one that i really really enjoyed so yeah. it was always good it was always nice for me to get back to that and get get into that so yeah yeah definitely yeah i loved i loved how you were you're you are able to speak so frankly about going to counseling yeah. because you know you're a fucking a man's man and you play your rugby you play your football and water off a duck's back you, you mentioned that i as just a, as just a not as a throw away remark on us and mm. I hope other people kind of assimilate that and like Jesus counseling's no big deal mm. you know talk therapy CBT whatever it is like that's that's not really a big deal it's not it's not something where and then I went to counseling yeah like you know it's just it's just one of those things that you did and it helped you feel better it's funny I remember like uh, the first time I went uh, I can't remember I think it was the first time I went but uh, it was I was living in Avon and it actually was during during the school day or whatever. But it was up in um, Blackcastle. But I remember like ringing the doorbell for this uh, this counselor and outside the office and just thinking to myself, just I really hope no one sees me because then they'll know that I'm going to counselling. Whereas my most recent experience of counselling, I just walked up and I rang the doorbell and I was like, I actually couldn't care less if anybody sees me just because yeah. to me it's just a normal, it's just a normal yeah. thing. Like I, I don't have any problem admitting it to anybody that like, as you said, like a man's man thing or a manly thing. I don't need to talk about that sort of thing. Like you go to the gym because you want to look after your, your physical well being. Like you yeah. play sport, you go for a run because you want to look after your physical well being. Yeah. So what's the harm in saying, Joe, you know actually I just, I went to, I go to counseling. I know, I know people who go uh, to counseling now, every like month or so yeah there's nothing wrong with them yeah they just yeah they just go once a month just yeah. because they feel like they want to do it okay. it's it's their kind of like i said their it's it's their gym for their own kind of yeah. sense of well-being like so yeah. it's fine it's just it's just a thing if there's a service there that people are offering well, and it's helpful then why not take advantage of it? yeah and it's funny i like, got i'm not a i'm not a big man for social media or anything but you're talking about, you know, you go into the gym to do a bit of exercise and you feel better. And the, the dichotomy between the first time you went into counselling and you're like, oh, fuck, ring the door, we're getting quick. I don't, down, don't want them to see Keep the hat on, like, and maybe, like, the fake glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People will take a selfie walking to the gym. Yeah. About to do a big workout now, hashtag physical health or hashtag, you know, motivated or something. Mm. Like, I hope we're kind of, on a path to having a similar approach to I think it's only, your, I think your, 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 your clinic or therapy. I think, it's only, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah. I, and I, do, I genuinely do feel like it is becoming a more acceptable yeah. and accepted part of society that, that certain people do this. Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I, th I think it is coming. And like I said, I don't know if it's because now in the last 10 years, I'm more aware of it because of my own kind of experience with it. But I don't think it is just that. I think there is certainly... Um, there's definitely more people who are coming out and saying, 
look, I have issues with anxiety and I have issues with depression. There's more people coming out and saying there's more people talking openly about it. There seems to be more people who actually are having issues. Now, I don't know, maybe that's because more people are talking about it yeah. or maybe it's more people are actually having it. Social media, I'm sure, has a big, uh, a big thing in it. Like, I'm, from the time I was living in Australia, I'm a big fan of uh, Aussie Rules football. The amount of people who are actually coming out and taking a break from the game, and it's not a case of, like, so they're professionals. They're not saying, oh, I've got an issue or, like, I've got a family issue or, like, even a guy came out during the week and he said, I'm taking an indefinite break from football until I can deal with my own mental health issues. I feel like a broken man at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. So they're really, really good. Like, they've all these role models coming out and, and dealing with, like, and people, like, are responding to that now. Like, yeah. it's, it's, like, it's so, it's really, really progressive over yeah. there. Like, and I think we're probably maybe a little bit behind in Ireland, but... Well, we're getting there. Like, you, you mentioned the likes of uh, Donald Walsh and his family and, uh, you know... I think like Tommy Tiernan has spoken quite frankly about his mm. his emotional history, as have Brezzy and other characters as well. Like and even even the likes of like I I shared my story and that was grand. It did whatever it did. But off the back of it, loads of people actually messaged me sharing their own stories, which were then shared pu publicly as well. So I think sometimes it takes uh, the likes of your Brezzies or the likes of your Aussie rural stars to kind of to lead lead the pack and then people like myself and yourself will come forward too yeah and it, it's more spoken about maybe it's more prevalent in in the society as well with referring back to things like the distractions i was talking about you know perhaps there actually is a higher incidence of uh, emotional discomfort and, and emotional suffering mm. in the kids now perhaps well, it's but, it's, i think it does kind of a lot of it some of it, not a lot, but some of it is related to kind of like cyberbullying. That that is a that is a big issue now for kids yeah. at the minute. Yeah. Um, it's a huge issue. Yeah. Um, like things like 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 Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. Um, and like even this year we've had instances in the school where people have had issues where they've kind of been bullied online and they've kind of felt like some of them have stopped coming to school and. Fuck. Yeah, you like you kind of I suppose, it like. You, you, if I was talking to kind of we, we talk about it in school the whole time but kind of just to make people aware of kind of like how much one comment yeah. said to a person at the wrong time can have such an impact so like I might be feeling at the, f the top of my health and someone can say something to me and it just like you said war off ducks back yeah. but that exact same comment at a different time in my life yeah. could be something that has like it could be something that tips me into yeah. kind of a place that I don't want to be. Yeah, and uh, so you should always you should always be aware of like how powerful like, like you can't guess what somebody's going to be feeling like when they read a comment that you say or when you make a kind of make a comment even directly to them. So you have to be yeah. kind of careful at that now. Yeah, yeah, because you don't know. Like I said, somebody who's listening to this now now might think I never knew that uh, that Murph was kind of going through or had this issues or like like cause some people get very very good at hiding it like i said yeah. i think i was very very good at hiding it people won't have, people might be surprised maybe i'm not yeah. as good as i think yeah well i think i think being good at hiding it is a disability yeah in possibly. a sense you know because it leads the people in the people who know you best in your life to actually not really know what's going on in your mind they might think they know mm. until they're fucking gravely mistaken and and in some in some instances they've realized they're gravely mistaken because that person has died by suicide yeah, Do you know, yeah, so a, I think being good, be, being good at hiding stuff is nothing to be proud of. No, Do you know, it's it fucking makes it harder. I think. Yeah, you know, like it can be. It can be, like I said, sometimes as well. It, it might be not that I'm not saying it's, um, but being able just to kind of function normally and like keep that momentum in going. Your professional that, life or whatever. In, in yeah. professional, personal, or like just trying to keep it going and not letting it kind of define you. Like that's, yeah, yeah. that is a good thing as well. Like yeah. so you kind of, there's, there's a balance there. Yeah, it's not, I suppose it's not, as, it's not as clear cut as being able to, bad. Yeah, no, being able to talk about it is a good thing, but being able to, to, to not talk about it as well and not let it kind Consume. of, exactly. Like yeah. you kind of want to have your conversations whatever and it's difficult, but being able to kind of just, 
maybe do other things as well, yeah. talk about other things as well. Yeah. And to, to get back just very briefly to yeah. the cyberbullying, um, might be useful for people to hear as well that it's not. I think we, we all have the stereotypical image of the bully. He's the fucking, he or she is the dickhead that, you know, shouts abuse at you or fucking gives you a dig when other people aren't looking or fucking tips all the shit out of your bag or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until recently I realised I was basically a cyber bully yeah. years ago. I I thought, I was, oh, how the laugh, it's great crack, taking the piss out of all these people. Should I really think it's funny too? Yeah. No, I... Now on reflection, they probably fucking didn't. Yeah, now right. I'm like, right, okay. So it's not, it's not as if now I censor myself. Mm-hmm. Now I just don't fucking go out of my way to say things that I think are funny, but actually fucking might upset people and stop them from going to school or something. Just like you said there, because yeah. I think the the real world implications that bleed out from the online world can be very surprising to people. And like, I would fucking hope people look at me and bully is not the fucking one of the things that comes to mind but I was a fucking cyber bully yeah. do you know now I figure out that you know the stuff I did wasn't probably the best uh, yeah. best behaviour to be doing but then I fucking would have upset people like, you know? I think like pretty simple guide like I don't know this is going to be groundbreaking is like if you wouldn't say it to someone's face yeah don't write it online yeah like so like yeah. keyboard warriors or whatever yeah, like, exactly. you know yeah. I mean, if you wouldn't say it like as 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 me sitting here in front of you yeah. I wouldn't say it to you and yeah don't say it to their face and like as well like I said I coming back to like my own personality I am someone who likes to kind of rip people out of it a little yeah. bit and kind of I suppose you do have to be careful as well but you don't want to go like sometimes you think like the world's gone crazy like P- yeah, PC it's like it's up, it's yeah. it's you have to be able to have a bit of crack as well. Like. Yeah. So just, as long as it's done in the right way and I kind of, I suppose, done with people that you have good relationships yeah. with, like I think people might, like will know that you're kind of doing it in, yeah. in, in, in a good natured way. Like, so a good natured, like roasting of someone is. Yeah. I think it may, it might surprise you, but I had actually never, I don't think I had heard of that idea of if you wouldn't say it to someone's face, then don't fucking, you know, post it on their mm-hmm. Facebook yeah. or write it under in an in- Instagram comment or something. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty fucking good rule. Yeah. Um, and just a couple, a couple of questions before we wrap up. Yeah. Um, you mentioned living in Australia for a year, and I know you also lived in New Zealand for a year as well. And you took a career break. How important has that been for you uh, in in terms of coming back and and leaving leaving Navan and leaving Ireland and kind of doing your own thing with your partner for a while? Like, uh, what? How how important was that for you? Yeah, for me, it was was very important. Um, I kind of, I suppose, with teaching, I kind of reached a point where I wasn't enjoying it anymore. I kind of, I just kind of, I wanted to, to get away. I, I Yeah, I, was, I just felt a little bit burnt out from it. So having that security where I could kind of, so for anyone who's not aware, teachers can apply, for, uh, can apply for a career break scheme where your job is basically held for you and then you apply for a year and you go away and then you can, reapply every year uh, annually up to five years you can take a five-year career break and still go back and you have your job waiting for you when you go back so look at, like i said at the time for me i was kind of i was just a little bit fed up with teaching didn't want to do it anymore so in this in the simplest terms when i had my two years away and i came back to it i actually did feel refreshed yeah. i came back and i kind of felt a little bit more motivated so look i think it's something that it definitely helped me. I think it's something that maybe could be employed in a wider sense for other organisations yeah. to offer that chance to people yeah. to go away. Like it's obviously it's easier said than done because people have like uh, it. It can maybe people are in roles where it's not just as easy to yeah. to fill them as it is in, in a teaching position. But definitely for me, it was kind of it's something that I felt has made me a better teacher now. Yes. Um. So even though it might. <laughs> might be a bit ironic like I said I was sick of teaching when I was away I was actually teaching as well it was very very different okay because I was only substituting yeah so you'd go in just on a day you you just go into the school um I did a lot of work in primary schools um you'd be there'd be a plan left for the day you'd just kind of do it and you'd go away so you'd work from from half eight in the morning until three and then you'd be gone yeah. I mean, there's no extras yeah so that's why i kind of i didn't mind it but it also kind of opened your eyes to things that they're doing in australia and things yeah. that they're doing in new zealand 
and I think that I've brought in, I've brought certain aspects of that back as well as the kind of just a freshness that I have. Um, I've brought in, I, I've brought ideas that I that I've seen in in New Zealand and Australia back, and not just kind of in my own classroom, but I've also talked about them and tried to implement some of them maybe in the school in a wider sense as well. So definitely, uh, definitely was uh, helpful. And I think even uh, maybe you you'll be able to disagree with this, but I think even if you don't have that security of knowing right in one or two years I'm going to come back to my job, that trip could be sufficiently important for your life to leave your current job where it's at and, you know, find a different job or see if there's a post available in the same organisation when you get back. Like, because I think we, I think there is a hierarchy of priorities we should have in our life yeah. and personal life should be before professional definitely I, I, it's easier said than done like don't get me wrong yeah. I understand that completely like it's easy for me to say I am uh, sure even if you don't have that maybe yeah. you should go away like to me having done it yeah. I don't think I would ever recommend somebody not to do it yes. to go away and live in a different country and see what it's all about and kind of meet people as well Yeah, I think for me probably the most enjoyable or the reason it was so enjoyable for me was because when I went to Australia, it would have been very, very easy for me to go over there and get caught up in the Irish culture over there. So yeah. play game football, go to the Irish bars and hang around loads of yeah. Irish people. Yeah. I went over to Australia and I made friends with Australians. Yeah. When I went to, and I, I made friends with English people and Scottish people and French people that I lived with. Yeah. Um, and there was Irish there as well, obviously. Yes, I didn't just completely exclude the Irish. Like, you know, yeah. Irish, I Irish, yeah. Good luck. But um, I definitely put myself out of my comfort zone and made some friends over there. And to me, that's why it was so enjoyable. Yeah. And I, I would, like, Melbourne was where I lived in Australia. To me, it, if I had to live somewhere, anywhere in the world, I'd live in Melbourne. Okay. And so I enjoyed it even more so than I did anywhere in New Zealand. Yeah. And I lived in Queenstown in New Zealand, right. which for anyone who's been, is probably one of the most beautiful places in the world it's like the adventure sports capital of the world. Like uh, you're, during winter, it's skiing. During, during summer, it's biking and trails and uh, abseiling and bungee jumps. And it's it's class. There's so much to do. But for me, Melbourne, I think probably it was to do with the people that I met in Melbourne. Yeah. I talk about how I like Australian rules and I started playing a little bit over there. And I just met like Aussie lads through that. And that environment, which I talked about, where I'm most comfortable, where it can lads can kind of they've got real good relationship, but like you're there's a kind of jokey mentality, and that that was exactly the way it was over there. So I just kind of like fit in like a, like a glove. I loved it. Yeah, brilliant. Um, but one thing that they have over there is that they're really really supportive. Like so, the group like the lads who are playing football as a group, like like you have lads who are like 23, 24, but every kind of couple of weeks someone would talk about something like important. So one guy, um, one time he ended up saving a guy's life with CPR. So at one of the training sessions at the end of it, you'd sit around, you'd have a bit of food and he actually got up and he was like, well, I'm going to tell my story now and I've invited somebody here. So, and they're going to talk about how you can sign up to do like a course in CPR or there's another time. How about a, a lad stood up and he's like, yeah, my, girlfriend actually had an accident there and she needed blood so like next week we're all going to give blood so mm. there's a, like a, there's a social uh, responsibility they kind of feel yeah. like they get involved in that as well yeah which is something that i kind of feel like sometimes we're a little bit behind over here yeah yeah that's fucking that's interesting yeah like most of the thing most of the time we just talk shite you know yeah. as if we like we're we're not fantastic at talking at, at having maybe more meaningful conversations mm. one of the reasons for the podcast like you know yeah. um, and it's fucking key to be part of the community and attack that loneliness that you might feel in instances where all you've done is talk shy to all your mates for the last 10 years they actually don't know about your fucking core values or the the biggest the, the most emotionally important thing that happened to you in the last 10 years they might know like you know yeah. but somebody I would be unsurprised if one of the I'm not sure if you're playing with Walter but if one of the Walter lads saved someone's life with CPR last weekend I just didn't hear about it because you know, we're too busy you know talking about fucking you know 
how crap Liverpool were the weekend or oh the state of your football boots yeah you know? exactly oh, and like I said it, over there there was a, they were probably a little bit ahead in that nice. in terms of that yeah Danny, that's cool and then before before we wrap up um, is there anything that you came into the conversation that you wanted to say um, no I don't think so I think uh, as you said it's important that um, that there's an openness now like and people can talk about uh, things that are kind of I suppose more than just small talk and like I suppose kind of when when like a while a while back when you kind of asked me if I wanted to do something like this um and, and do the podcast with you it was something that initially I was like oh, I'm not sure about doing it but I suppose when so I was one of the so people might be aware of for one of the mental health weeks that we we had at the time was mental health week uh we, I got in touch with you and asked you to to, to do a video you were just um, started to come out with cash face and um, right, and, and, and that yeah so and I got you to do a video for the lads and something that they really enjoyed at the time so kind of felt like I wanted to to support the work that you're doing now yeah. in, in, in this these kind of series of podcasts and everything that you're doing with you and, and everything like that so it was something I just want to come in and to, to help you out but uh, no, I do think it's important that people are able to talk about um everything and anything like yeah. you feel comfortable talking about whatever it is that you want to talk about whether that's not just small talk whether that's actually something that's a little bit deeper yeah and yeah so like getting that culture getting it out there i think that's that is really important so more so than anything that i've said today i think it's important that people just realize that they can talk about whatever it is they want they, they don't have to talk about they don't have to talk about it, but knowing that they can talk about whatever they want then i think that's that's really important so Kieran Murphy this thank podcast is all about you thank you very very much thank cheers you. thank you very much for listening and before you go I'd like to refine one point that I made during my conversation with Kieran. so I mentioned how the quality of life and the quality of distraction has improved for people and how I think distractions are possibly one of the greatest sources of suffering today what I meant by that and which I didn't articulate very well is that with high quality distractions we don't really address the suffering that we are experiencing we can just unlock our phone, fly through Facebook, fly through Instagram, fly through Snapchat, talk shite to somebody, like a picture, go on Reddit, read a few jokes, watch a couple of YouTube videos. It's all at our fingertips. So if we're not feeling well, we might be doing the most effective thing in feeling better. We just distract ourselves from the thing that's making us feel bad and we don't actually address it. So the thing that's making us feel bad, it's still in our minds. It's just put at the back. When you accumulate all this shit, well, it can come to the fore at times you don't expect it, and then you don't even realise why you're feeling shit. And and then a time comes where the distractions just don't cut the mustard, and you're feeling fucked, and you're not feeling good. So the reason I wanted to mention this is, if you're not feeling good, think about it. Don't go straight to the distraction. Why are you feeling bored? Why are you feeling pearly? Why are you feeling sad? Why are you feeling angry? Think about it for a moment. Allow yourself to feel shit, or angry, or bored, and then proceed. But before you go straight for your phone, before you go straight to the distraction, think, why am I looking for my phone? Why am I searching for my phone? Am I trying to distract myself, or do I want to seek some information? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you didn't, please get in touch. I'd love to know why you didn't enjoy it, how it could improve, what type of questions you think I should be asking. And if you did enjoy it, also, please get in touch. I'd love to know what you thought I did well, why you liked the show, and if you did like it, please subscribe and share this episode and listen to the back catalogue of what I have. I'll be back shortly with another episode.